located in the Central Valley of California. The Fresno Fire Department. Established in 1877, the Fresno Fire Department is one of the oldest departments in the United States, rich in history and tradition. Today on the battalion, we join the crew at Station 13. A station with urban search and rescue capabilities, or more specifically, water rescue. We will be with them today through their training that will focus on new team members' search and rescue techniques in a local swimming pool, and later on the San Joaquin River. Captain Domlin Joel goes over some paperwork. My name is Domlin Jewell. I'm a captain with the City of Fresno Fire Department. I'm currently assigned to Engine 13 here, which is also a USAR urban search and rescue station. Um, I've been on the department about 17 years, and I promoted to captain about eight years ago. It's our first day of our new uh, shift since the transfer. So we're on the C shift now. We went from the A to the C, so it's a whole new world for us. Yeah, I already wrote Platoon A instead of Platoon C. I'm already messed up. There it is. C. I became a firefighter. I had always had an interest in emergency services. I started studying first aid, CPR, and things like that in high school. Um, and after that, I got involved with a rescue team, a uh, volunteer rescue team in Ventura County, where I was from, and began running emergency medical calls up there in the forest and, and in surrounding areas of Ventura County. And after that, I just, it always was in the back of my mind that I had an interest and I wanted to do it, but I pursued other interests and eventually came back to deciding I wanted to become a firefighter full time. Firefighter, and now part of the USAR and water rescue team, Keola Park, came in early on his first shift since his very recent transfer from Station 3's A shift to Station 13's C shift. He is out there in traffic, filling the booth with donations from Jerry's Kids Muscular Dystrophy Drive that the fire department participates in every year. My name's Kilo Park. I'm with the Fresno Fire Department. I'm currently I'm a firefighter assigned to Station 13, member of our urban search and rescue team. And here at Station 13, we specialize in water rescue. Well, every two years we do our biannual transfer where you draw your firehouse based on seniority and qualifications. Prior to this assignment here at 13s, I was assigned to Engine 3 on the A shift, one of the busiest engine companies, actually the busiest engine company within the City of Fresno Fire Department where I got some good experiences, ran lots of fires, lots of calls, had a great crew there. It's time for morning chores. Keola starts his first 48 cleaning the restrooms. Now, he's in the kitchen going the extra mile. He is a bit of a clean freak. There's dry mopping the floors, and then there is dry mopping the floors. First call of this 48. It's a carbon monoxide alarm going off in a residential home. So what, uh, what do I push on this thing? Oh. Still have to
they arrive on scene, they find a home that has its alarms detecting CO2 going off. So this is a pretty new unit, I take it? Pretty, fairly new unit? Yeah, mm -hmm. and then brand new battery. We changed the battery out. So what happened was weird. I closed all the house down, uh -huh. and then this went off. The crew checked the home for carbon monoxide with their four gas monitor. We've got our monitor. You don't have any, there's no carbon monoxide in there. Cool. So. Well, I appreciate that. It's, it's just a bad unit. It's zero, negative, zero, of course, we know that. They do not detect any CO2, so they conclude that they must have a faulty device. Hi, I'm Jan Hernandez, and we called the uh, fire department because our carbon monoxide went off on our alarm, and then we changed the battery, and it still went off, so we called the non-emergency fire department, and they suggested the fire um, department come over. We're only, we have one one and a half blocks away from us just to make sure that we weren't breathing something poisonous so we stood outside until the gentleman came and did a good check and some great advice. Uh, we got dispatched to a residential fire alarm on scene. I just grabbed the four gas monitor. This is our Q-Ray 2 and their seal detector was going off so we didn't know if it was a battery issue or there was actual CO, put the monitor to work, came back negative on any alarms, so parts per million were at zero, so we're good, cleared it out, and if they have another problem, they'll call us back. But yeah, this is our four gas monitor. Tells us our LEL, our oxygen level, our H2S gas, and our CO. So all of our rigs have these, and heavily utilized by our hazmat team. Engine 13 is available on the radio. Today, USAR members from the crews from all three shifts will be training at the pool. Captain and team leader Dom Jewell explain the drills for today. What we're going to do today is we're going to do a search drill as if we had a, a, a person that went underwater. We arrived on scene and we're going to try to do a search and find him. Divers controlled by the tender. I went over the line pull signals with you guys briefly, but we do the oath system. One, two, three, four. Do you remember what I said about the, the dive signals? So one's okay. Two is stop and face the line. Three is change of direction. And four is emergency signal. Tenders have that. You'll see, we'll video it, we'll show the process. It's Firefighter Park's turn. He jumps into the water. The point of this trip is to give the firefighter the familiarity of diving using different search techniques to locate a victim or an item. They first train in this controlled pool environment to work on their technique. One of the divers uses his phone in a waterproof case to film his friend Keola during this training exercise. One of the first things we did when I came on board was pool training, where we did our dive and water training. What we did there was we did basic scuba training where we're blindfolded. We do search techniques using communication by rope pools. We also use our surface applied Kirby Morgan system where we dived in the pool at about 15 feet of depth in a more controlled environment just to get us more familiar with our equipment. They are able to communicate with the diver underwater using a special system designed for hard hat diving. The divers know all too well that training is nothing like the real thing. Real life incidents are unpredictable and rapid paced. This is to brush off the rust that sets in between training and calls. Cool. 
After finishing in the pool, the crew travel to a very popular part of the San Joaquin River. Okay, uh, uh, today we're out at the San Joaquin River, one of our primary operating areas that we operate our uh, rescue boat and our rescue swimmers and our rescue divers. We're training on public safety diving today. This is a heavy use area. We get a lot of beachgoers out here. and um, So we're gonna be diving out here to simulating a point last scene where a swimmer went down. We were called to the scene and attempting to do a rescue. Um, yeah, so we'll be operating out here doing our public safety diving, doing our tether diving off this beach right here, which is a, an area that we, you know, it's nice to train here because this is an area that we could be called in the summer to actually perform a rescue. It does not take long for the crews to set up since three crews are here. They go through the same techniques they just did in the pool, this time in a much less controlled environment with swift water. Another evolution that we did that afternoon was on the San Joaquin River, which is located in Engine 13's first in district. We met at the river shore. We had Engine 13, Rescue 13, Truck 4, and Rescue 4. We gathered all the necessary equipment and set everything up. I then got into my wetsuit and was assisted by other team members with placing the pony bottle harness on, getting the weight belts on, and finally the surface supplied air helmet. Once everything was in place, we tested the communication system and the backup safeties. I then got entered the water and got my body acclimated to the freezing temperatures because the San Joaquin River water comes from the freezing snow melt from the Sierra Nevada. So once my body was acclimated, I descended to the bottom of the river. Once at the bottom, I began my search, fighting to the swift currents of the San Joaquin River. The amount of weight needed to keep a person stationary with this water movement is nearly four times what they would use for scuba diving. successfully located the object and communicated to Topside what I found, where I found it, and that I was ready to exit the water. I slowly and safely ascended back to the surface and was once back to the surface I was assisted by other team members with exiting the water where they also helped me remove all the equipment and the evolution was complete. They finished their training. Everyone helps out with the packing of the gear. USAR, truck four, the utility truck, and the engine all go back on the radio and are back in the service. En route to the station, they decide that it is a good time to go shopping for groceries. It looks like it's Keola that will be cooking today. Kiel is making fajitas for dinner for his new sea shift crew. They get their groceries and return to the station without any calls. Keola starts their dinner. Before they are able to eat, they get a call. This call is very stereotypical. 
It's a call that a cat is stuck in a tree. Firefighter Keola Park attempts to lure the frightened cat down with a can of cat food that he sets on the fence. No. <laughs> now he's saying ow. Yeah. Here we go. You're there, Seymour. Seymour. There we go. Here we go. I got you. I got you. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> a little encouragement. There he is. He does exist. Hey, Seymour. Yeah. Okay, who needs to go with you? Yeah. Thank you again. Glad it got down. It just needs some tuna down there. That's all I'm going to say. The worst part is down here, feet of water. He just needed some moral support. <laughs> See you guys. Firefighters offered uh, moral encouragement. And the cat came right down. Firefighter Keola is obviously a cat whisperer. A few taps of his knuckles, and the cat was down within 10 minutes. After they help retrieve the cat, they return to the station. Keola finishes up the dinner. Two guy on the list is and was the eye, Gilbert, so I don't know if they would slide. Late night, a call comes in. It's a jumper on the 99 freeway. Firefighter Park leaves the station in the rescue utility truck with the airbag in the back. Speeding rescue for engines. 313, truck 4, rescue 13, rescue 4, trying to 4563, current in highway 99. CHP is reporting on current over at 99. We're asking you all apparatus to stage, hold back. Operation Fire Channel 1, first on safety, current IC. This call is a suicide call. Captain Jewel and the engineer leave on the engine. Yeah, so we got called out to a jumper call down in Engine Three's area downtown. The highway patrol has stopped all traffic going both directions. On scene, we arrive to a freeway overpass with police working to contact the jumper. From this standpoint, you can see that the jumper has been slicing his wrist and bloodletting and threatening to jump. Stand by, we'll verify their location. Truck 4, engine 3. Go ahead. You guys have airbags? Uh, jumper bag? That's firm, man. That's firm. It's on uh, rescue 13. Do we have a uh, specific spot you want to set it up at? Uh, the person's actually out on the traffic sign, out on over the freeway. They have the freeway shut down if you want to come up. Come up the Northbound lanes of 99, you can get on the other side of the on-ramp to set it up, or the other side of the overpass to set up. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll do a face-to-face with you. We'll make a plan by the time Rescue 13 gets down here. Captain. Captain, who's up there, which is 
The USAR team arrives. And, uh, the utility truck arrives yeah, on scene. And the crews from the USAR team, truck four and engine 13, begin its deployment. They do not want the jumper to know what's going on below. The time to communication. Police officers line the overpass chain link fence trying to reach out to see what state of mind he is in. Cutting his wrist shows that he means business. The airbag is filling up. The USAR team from Station 4 sets up the air cushion underneath the overpass out of the view of the jumper. Anything can happen at any point. The jumper may get upset with all that's going on to save him and could just jump at any time. Once the air cushion is fully inflated, it is slowly and carefully moved into position beneath the jumper. Well, we, we, the, the, the officers are debating whether or not they're going to tase him or beanbag him and force him into the bag. And the issue is because he is, normally we'd wait for negotiations and stuff like that, but because of the, the bleeding out of the, of, the, of the wrist he's doing right now, it's a concern that he could actually bleed out before he even jumps, so he might be better just to tase him and get him into the bag. So law enforcement's figuring that one out right now. The decision is made to see if they can bring the truck in and possibly use the bucket for access to their patient. Yeah. So it looks like we're going to put our, our ladder truck up and pin him in on one side, remove our bag, that way we can utilize our full bag all the way over against one side. And then we will uh, put uh, three uh, CHP officers up there. And if he uh, makes any moves toward him, they're going to try to use left lethal shotgun, beanbag shotgun. Uh, he does have a blade in his hand. Uh, weapon so uh, they're concerned about that so we're gonna do that and this way he'll be safe uh, if, if they use the if they use the beanbag or the taser um, he'll hopefully just fall into the bag not they'll probably push him This is very risky. The man can end up either way, on either side, and not hit the bag. Captain Chad Tucker is up above and running the ops with Captain Joel below. This is all in unison with the battalion chief and the police department. Firefighter engineer Chris Garcia from Engine 3 takes the control of the ladder. Chris slowly moves the ladder into position. Now in position, the police officers ask the man to jump into the airbag. When he declines the third time, they choose a taser. A heads up firefighter notices that the bag is out of position after the jumper is struck by the taser and repositions it accordingly.
the man is very violent and did not want to be saved. The police officers have to wrestle with the man to get him in cuffs and secured so as they can help him. The paramedics move in and begin to wrap their patient's wrists that have been sliced. With a lot of help from everyone, the patient is secured and placed on the gurney. The patient is on his way to the psych ward. Who knows what drove this man to make this harsh decision? Put the ladder up like we said. Uh, CHP officers made entry up there. Um, at that point, he didn't comply. They tried to do it, get him to comply. He didn't comply. He had a weapon in his hand. So they tased him. Saw him stiffen out. It was a little bit dicey there for a minute. Stiffened out, and then the officer just flipped him perfectly into our bag. So we cleared it. We were a little worried he might slip through when he was in that stiff state. But he flipped, the officer flipped him right into our bag. So it was actually perfect. He's doing fine. He should be all right. He was still conscious. He was a little groggy from the tase, but other than that, uh, the bag worked perfectly, so protected him on his fall. And he's being transported right now to the trauma unit, and so should have a good outcome physically, and we'll hopefully get some uh, help for the future. The crews rinse down the scene and put away their gear. The crews from the USAR rig engine 13, the utility rescue rig, and engine 3, all are now available on the radio. Yeah, it's crazy about that. You know, he hit a UPS truck on the 99. His car ends up on the side of the road. Fresno PD's magic team confronted him in his car, and he uh, went berserk, broke out of his car. They said he busted out the glass. Took off running across the freeway, running zigzagging across. Somehow he ended up here climbing down onto this sign and uh, where he started slitting his wrist, threatening to jump into the traffic, so. Bizarre. <laughs>